This is LaFleck, and you're listening to Jazz Is Not What You Think. Hello, I'm here with Abel Fleck, best known for his supergroup, the Flecktones, but his collaborations have been absolutely fantastic. Between his wife, Abigail, who's a stellar banjo player, a bassist, Edgar Meyer, uh, the legendary Chick Corea, of course. But, you know, for those of you who don't know, Bale has also played with the Dave Matthews Band, Asleep at the Wheel. He's worked with phenomenal artists like Jean-Luc Pani and Stanley Clark. I actually saw a video recently with my new buddy, Corey Wong. Bailey, you're all over the place. It's great to have you. Your styles uh, continue to move in different directions. Welcome. Thank you. Wow. What a great intro. Oh, you deserve it. And uh, I, I, we'll talk about your new album as well with Zakir Hussein and Edgar Meyer. But um, I wanted to start by making a, a formal apology to you. You Uh-oh. may not even remember this. Um, what did you do? The very, Bailey, the very first time um, I wanted you on the cover of Jazz Is. Uh, I can't remember how the photo shoot went, but I, I remember them designing the cover. And the headline for the cover was Bela Fleck smoking grass. Yeah, right. And, right. Never, never. And, I, and the whole idea was, you know, here's Bela Fleck, this just incredible banjo player doing things you can never imagine. And you may not remember, but you called me and you said, um, man... I wish you didn't use that headline because it, that, it's not me. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. And I said, don't worry, Bela, that will never happen again. Right. Well, I think what it was for me is is I feel like a freedom fighter for the banjo as, as a musical instrument. And so, so typically people want to put the banjo into the country, the you know, the hillbilly point of view. Um, and, um, and, and what I was doing with the flectones was trying desperately to point out that there are other avenues for the banjo and places where it can be at home and make a contribution outside of that world. And then, I mean, Hey, smoking grass is perfectly now it's legal in most of the States, but you know, the band was trying was the band wasn't like a pothead band, even though we were associated with, with the dead audience uh, or some of our audience, um, that wasn't what we were trying to be. And some people make a distinction of, you know, positioning themselves in that world because it, it connects them with the people that are of a like mind. We we're kind of we take all comers, but we also always wanted to be a, a band that kids could come see. So um, and at that time, that was uh, a connotation that maybe you weren't that. So that that's all it was. I mean, I was thrilled to be on Jazz Is. I couldn't believe I was on the cover. But then when I saw that it was smoking grass, I was like, oh man, I'm trying so hard to be taken seriously. I've always been a serious kind of a person about the banjo because I think banjo music is is deadly serious. It can be fun, but it's not a joke. It's not a joke. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah my mission for the whole the whole ride well, well so so then what happened um yeah a couple of years later um we featured you on the cover again and uh the editors came up with another kind of headline that was questionable and it was it said blazing bella and i was like guys bella asked that we not make reference to those things so so again I, what i will promise you publicly is the next time <laughs> um, there'll be there'll be no negative references, uh, even for fun. I don't uh, think blazing is as bad. Uh, blazing okay. is bad, but uh, smoking. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a pretty funny picture. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. Uh, J- artist J- uh, Joe Chardiello is a very famous uh, character artist. Yeah, uh, but it must be Mad Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, not to reference that you're mad. Uh, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea here. Just blazing. I was just blazing. I, <laughs> I wasn't mad. So, so the other thing I wanted to mention is we, we, we've had, we, we've done some really cool illustrations uh, of you, believe it or not. And I'm going to send you this one. I actually looked in our warehouse. Oh, wow. And I found this wow. all wrapped up. Yeah. And this was probably done maybe 30 years ago. And, and um, I'm going to send this to you. It's, it's actually painted on wood. I don't know if I ever it, seen that one. And maybe- yeah somewhere i'm that's, that's... It, it, it was on the inside of the magazine not on oh. the cover wow and uh anyway I, i'm set not that i don't want this to be like a game show was what do we have for these fine guests we <laughs> have a, a great painting of bail of flat anyway that looks I'm, really I'm sending, i'd love to have that uh, i'm sending it to you yeah thanks and with that yes the there last thing i wanted to mention which is kind of an interesting thing because it, it references the flat tones is um future man syntax mm. 
Now, there, there's actually a story behind that um, that I was kind of involved in, and you probably didn't know this, but in the earliest days of Jazz Is, I featured Lee Rittenauer on the yeah. cover. That's before, where he comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. before we were before Lee and I became business partners, mm. I didn't even know him back then. And we featured him with the syntax on the cover. And I get a call from the company that made the syntax uh, in Oxford in, in England. Yeah. And they said, wow, you're featuring that you're the first magazine in the world to feature the syntax on the cover. Uh, you, we want to meet you at NAM. We want to do a whole presentation. They had like a 20 foot cover of Lee Rittenauer playing the syntax. And I went to that party and because I'm a horrible guitarist, but was enamored by the fact that I was in great company, I put one of those syntax on, I started playing it and in walks Alan Holsworth, uh, David Torn, Christopher Cross. And I just slowly took it off, <laughs> not to embarrass myself, only to find years later, that's where Roy got the, the guitar. The first the, one, the, yeah. The, 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 the first one. It might have, might not even been the first uh, electric drum um, uh, controller he created, but it was it was the first serious one. And he discovered in the end that it actually wasn't a sensitive enough instrument for him to use. So he built a whole new instrument on top of the synth. That he used the the poly, but he just built his own triggers that were ISOs that were much more um, dynamic. And that's how he got his whole thing. And he's really into being dynamic. Uh, ironically, he when he plays the drums, he's a monster. You know, he's he's a banger. Uh, with the you know, when he plays the syntax, he's looking for dynamics. So he um he really calls it something else. Well, I think as as the many things that mesmerize people that watch your live shows, it was pretty incredible to see. Wait, is the drum coming from yeah. that guitar thing? Yeah, it was a lot of and fun. It, it, it was great. Um, We're going back together well, in a couple of weeks to to play for the that, first time in five years. It's going to be nice. Wow! Yeah, that'll be great. Well, I, I look forward to that. Now, nationally, you're doing a tour because I, I look at your tour schedule. I didn't see anything in the southeast where I am. No, we're just doing uh, six shows. We're working our way out to Telluride for the 50th anniversary, and they asked us if we would come appear. Wow. So I said, well, if we can get you know if everyone's available and everybody wants to, and uh, and we can get enough dates to you know to get it together. So we have six shows and. And then after that, we'll talk. We'll see what everybody feels like. If we want to try and do some more, um, it'd be nice. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to talk about Abigail because obviously a great musician. Yeah. Being married to a great musician. Yeah. Um, you guys have done really very interesting projects together. Um, what's that like? Just give, give our audience a feeling. I mean, you're married to a stellar musician who, who plays the banjo. And, and tell me what, the, I, I know you guys met at a square dance, you know, years and years ago, but how does that work blending that personal and professional life? Well, in the beginning, it never really seemed like it was something that was going to blend. I, I loved her music and I thought she was really special. And I remember being at parties before we were a couple and she would be singing and all the girls would be sitting around on the floor crying, listening to her singing. This is not me, this is not me. And that, but then as we got to know each other, I... I got to be a real fan of her singing and playing, which is very earthy and very, uh, there's a lot of tradition in it, but also an open, an open mind and uh, connection to uh, other cultures. So um, she has this rare authenticity when she sings that I have to say, I don't work with a lot of vocalists, but um, boy, I sure know it when I hear one that speaks to, to, to you in an honest way. And a lot of them don't. A lot of the greatest sing good singers, they're so busy singing. She's always about connection and about, uh, you know, going to her deepest self uh, when she sings. So I love playing with her. And then we have a really fun repartee when we play as a duo. When we had our first child, Juno. We went on tour together. And it was one of those things where you just say, this is what we're going to do. We don't know how it's going to work out, but we're not going to be, I'm not going to be on tour for, you know, 200 days when we have a kid and we're not going to be separate. We're not going to be off running, doing different things. And so we started touring together and it turned out to be, Luckily, a great, a great thing. We 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 built a, a duo that really worked uh, in a kind of a folk slash banjo centric world, like a, a a group with only banjos in it, which doesn't really exist particularly in the world, you know. And especially someone who plays in the old clawhammer style, the way she does, and I and me in the bluegrass, a technique. Um, finding a way to make those go together has never been. Um, an easy thing to do, and it hasn't been done that much. So in that way, it it spoke to me and my like desire to 
find new ways to play the banjo. And then I got to be the bass player on a bass banjo or a cello banjo. I got to play a piccolo banjo or I got to be, you know, the only soloist on a song, you know, like as if I was a guitarist or whatever. And so I found a lot of ways to be creative and have a lot of fun. And then we started writing songs together too. And during the pandemic, we had our web series called Banjo House Lockdown, which was a lot of fun. And now we're kind of in a situation where um, the most recent collaboration we did was a an orchestra piece, a song cycle for the Colorado Symphony, which we recorded and it's turned out really well. And we're going to be putting that out and hopefully get to do more of that. But we're also in a position where the boys are, we have a five-year-old and a 10-year-old. And so it's hard for us to be away from home very much because um, they get tardy, you know, they get they get in trouble for being out of school and we, we want them to graduate. Uh, but we Australia this year and we spent a month on tour um, performing in Australia and New Zealand and that was a lot of fun. Well, homeschooling is becoming the norm now. And, uh, you know, I have a five and a 10 year old and 11 year old and a 14 year old. And I never thought I'd homeschool them, but that's what we're doing. And actually we're spending more and more time with our kids, which, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's what we want to do. Right. It's a gift. I mean, I think after the pandemic years, um, we, we'd had enough homeschooling. Juno was, he needed that outside world. Um, but, um, but yeah, when we're on tour, we make sure that he keeps up with his lessons and so forth like that. And we had to, we could, it's, of course, it's horrifying to see the things that happen in, in schools, uh, just about a, two miles from here is where the covenant shootings happened and, uh, our hearts was broken. Our kids were in lockdown. It was just a very frightening day, but, um, yeah. I yeah. can totally relate. Uh, I live down the street from, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in Parkland. Oh. So it was the same thing. And it was, I still, that day still haunts me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I by there regularly and uh, sit, sit and think about it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's infuriating and it's in frightening and, um, it's a powerless feeling, all these things. Um, but it just, uh, it's not the way we're supposed to do it. It's not the way no. we, we need to be doing things. No. No, absolutely. Speaking about culture, um, there's a there's an interesting connection between uh, getting back to Abigail uh, and her kind of in interest and exploration in Chinese culture. Yeah, um, and I find that fascinating because I think I think China is very very misunderstood and 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 with with the kind of music that you do and and Abigail does and you do together, um, have you seen maybe people connecting a little more with China because you know music is the is the you know universal language well i think it's it's a way to bring uh china, some china culture into some situations where you wouldn't normally see it like for instance a festival a folk festival all of a sudden we do a traditional chinese song but you know because we were doing kind of folk songs there were also people that took exceptions hey you're not chinese you know it's the me too era so people are looking for to be sure that you're not you know taking advantage of other people or or making jokes about other people um but those people themselves would, would enjoy it you know so it's it's a a, a twist but um but uh, we love doing that music and going to china when we would do anything traditional um over there tr chinese people would flip and and just really be be happy you know it turns out that most countries are are a little bit egocentric and if you show up in another country and you learn a song of theirs they like that better than anything else you do even if it's a ch children's rhyme you learn that song around the world, which is lucky because you know you don't have to learn the hardest thing in their repertoire to make a connection and find a way to play with the musicians. It can be something quite simple. It's more about the effort. People really care about it. And then in, in, along the way, you learn. You learn things, and if you go deeper, you you know you get more. Obviously, uh, you you don't have to keep it simple, stupid. But um, sometimes a simple theme, as you know, if you're in the jazz world, if a simpler theme in in jazz or classical music is easier to expand and grow and and be spontaneous with than a quite complex theme and you kind of have less options um, and things you can do with it. So, so anyway, we, we love that part of it. She, she's done quite a lot of, I think maybe 17 tours to China while well, with the state department together, we went over there and were able to go to Tibet and perform with the Chinese and American governments in partnership back when we had our spiral quartet. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot that was very, it was very, it was a weird time to go. And, and, you know, we, we questioned whether we should go, but, and we decided it was better to go and see what was going on over there. Sure, and sure. What was going on over there. Oh, yeah. But now, you know, interestingly, uh, um, I was actually surprised years ago when I read about you that you're originally from New York City. I am. So, so you know, it's like there is a couple of, you know, misconceptions. You know, obviously, bluegrass banjo, not typically thought about as a New York thing. 
Um, and, and now you obviously you don't live in New York anymore, but you grew up in the city. So you were a city guy, city boy. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and then from there, I read the story how you were listening to something on the train and, and that sort of inspired your love for the banjo. Well, it was um, a hillbillies theme. Uh, was the first thing that I heard. That's what that's what got me first. Earl Scruggs, and for most people that are gonna be banjo players, it's Earl Scruggs that, that turns the key and activates them from being a dormant possible banjo person to being a rabid banjo freak. And that's what happened with Earl Scruggs. People talk about BB King having that power on on guitarists or different people. Earl, you know, there's lots of banjo players out there, but Earl is always the one who turns the key. And so when I heard that, that was interesting, but I didn't tell anybody about it because I was a New York kid and it was a laughing stock, honestly. That's... It wasn't until Dueling Banjos came out a while later. My grandfather saw that. I was trying to learn some guitar in a half-assed manner and uh, he said, oh, maybe you'd like this. And so the day before high school, um, he said, uh, I went to visit him and, and I got him. That's the train part of the story. I, I, I took the train up to Peekskill where he lived and he gave me this banjo he got at a garage sale and it was like, I didn't have the nerve to think I could play the banjo. I didn't think anyone could really play it. It was so intimidating. But when someone put one in my hands, I couldn't put it down. And my grandfather did that. And from the day one of high school, I was a banjo player. First and foremost, I was just in love with it. And, but then again, I was growing like in jazz appreciation class in high school in New York City. Uh, they played me Chick Corea, you know, uh, the Spain. And then I went in just about three blocks from my house uh, where I lived in uh on the Upper West Side. I went to see him at the Beacon Theater with Return to Forever. My mind was blown and my life was changed and I wanted to do that, even though I was a band player. So it was just a weird thing, you know. And now, also, I have to say there's a lot of New York great banjo players. Some of them, some of the very most well-known and, and t- they tend to be innovators. People like uh, Bill Keith would be one of the, the big ones who also played with Bill Monroe for a little while but was mostly known for transforming the banjo into more of a jazz instrument from the bluegrass perspective. And then there's Tony Trishka, who was my teacher, direct teacher. And he's uh, he's just a freewheeling, progressive, primitive modernist. Uh, he's just a uh, uh, very much himself um, unique player. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of banjo players. And, and also remember that this is coming out of the folk boom, 60s. So uh, now I'm a kid in the early 70s. There's lots of banjo playing in New York City and some really good players. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that, that was it. before... Before I had heard of the Flectones, there was this new acoustic movement. Right. And it was, it was Tony and Sam. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, Mark David O'Connor. Brisbane. David, David Brisbane. Brisbane. Piece of it, yeah. He was the king. And, of it. And, and yet, while they were doing this thing in that direction, you continued to do that, but then went in this other direction. And now it makes sense when you talk about Return to Forever. There were these, basically, this music that you were turned on to say, like you said, I want to do some of that. Well, the other piece of it for me is I was watching all of these guys, Tony Rice, uh, David mm-hmm. Grisman, and they were starting to do music without a banjo because there re- really wasn't a person on the scene who could follow them into that music, and it stamped it with that same irritating stamp of hillbilly music, and they didn't want it, they wanted to grow into a new place, and I was like, I don't want to see banjo taken out of this music. I want to be the guy who plays with you guys, and so I just clawed my way into that scene and tried to find, you know, tried to take my place, but um, but I was really very much uh, coming from the same places as Tony Rice and Sam Bush and Jerry Douglas and 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 Tony Trishka and all these guys, just looking for a way to be be myself on the instrument. Um, and maybe I had a little more l- legit jazz um, just from growing up around it. I, I had a tendency to be able to um, assimilate a little bit more. Like Tony was more; he would have a lot of jazz in his music, but it wasn't. He wouldn't go and play with a jazz music you know, in a jazz group. He would just jazz elements into his bluegrass but i i was actually going to jazz clubs and trying to sit in and trying to play the tunes and read the changes and learn the learn the language you know uh, more directly so that that gave me some different tools when i went back to bluegrass which i i did again here recently with the bluegrass hard album but we got to talk about zakir and edgar that's what's uh that's what that's, that, that's that is said. that we're not it's the new album uh two artists who i have followed for years who are absolutely stellar um you pick, you pick good friends and and collaborators, and this is an album that takes you. I wouldn't say in a completely different direction because it it includes some of the music that you're so great at. But there's there's definitely uh, the influence that you're seeing with Edgar, uh, and 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 the the tabla and the things the Indian music 
the influences that are on that album are certainly something that is an, another new direction for for Bela Fleck. Tell us about how that collaboration happened and and what it meant to record this record. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important when you're collaborating to play with the best people you can play with and try not to feel intimidated and, and remember to bring yourself to the party. Because now, now I, the reason I say that is because Edgar and Zakir and also Rakesh, Rakesh Chirasi, who plays flute with us, are people with a lot of information that I don't have, that I didn't grow up with. Um, and Zakir, uh, I mean, Rakesh, they're, they're at the very highest levels of Indian music. Zakir is probably the most well-beloved living Indian musician at this, at this point, And he's a superstar in India and around the world. And Rakesh grew up in that world playing with, uh, learning from his uncle, um, Harry Prasad, who is the, the great, the, you know, the king of the, the bamboo flute for, for ages and ages. And so being around those guys, you, there's a tendency to go, I'm not worthy and teach me about Indian music, but that's not what we're there for. Um, there to bring ourselves as well so we have to find a way to learn from each other while bringing ourselves to the party edgar the same thing i've i've known edgar for so long and i'm still you know blown away by his uh his musical mind and and the things that he does and um he has the whole classical world at his fingertips in his in his brain he, he grew up with that world i didn't you know and um he knows how to compose like like nobody i've ever met and then his ability on the bass is so idiosyncratic. We talk about trying to be yourself. He is the most himself. Nobody plays like him in the world. And, and usually that means, you know, show off talent. Nobody can play like, oh, holy cow. It's not just that. It's like sometimes it's the subtlety. Sometimes it's the bow, the way he plays with the bow, the the expression he can get with an instrument that's that hard to play, um, uh, the command, but also this bigger picture about music. That's uh, oh, There's a lot to learn from all these guys. So I'm just... I'm just happy as can be. I'm like learning from everybody. Everyone in the room can be my teacher, which is the way the black tones were too. Everyone in the band can teach each other things. I like I like that. So so anyway, this thing started with a, a project that Edgar and Zakir and I did together, which was a, an orchestra piece, a, 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 a triple concerto written for the opening of the new Symphony Hall in Nashville when it opened up back. And uh, they invited me and Edgar to, to pick a a triple concerto partner and write something. They wanted Nashville writers to write the, the piece to commemorate the opening. So we wrote a piece called it uh, the, uh, the Melody of Rhythm. And uh, and then we filled out the album with several other trio pieces. And then we went and did some touring and really had a great time playing. And after a couple of years, we all went back to our normal lives. At some point, we went to India to jam with Zakir one year, and he introduced us to Rakesh. And that was a whole new world. Suddenly, it kind of gave us a new place to go with this trio. And certainly... It, it became a band because with the trio, um, we didn't have a way for Edgar, Zakir, and I to groove together underneath a soloist because there was only three of us. So it was very sparse. We're always looking for that space, a way to make Edgar comfortable to solo. And then you'd have, when I soloed, it was always just, you know, I was the soloist and there was like a rhythm section with no no chords. But anyway, with Rakesh, suddenly gave us this opportunity to have the biggest sound the group could have where, he, where the flute is is cranking and the three of us are really building underneath them and you can really take it somewhere. And so we, we decided to do some touring that way and, um, and made a record sort of right at the end of the tour of all this new music, which was, uh, I believe it was maybe October or November just before the pandemic hit. So all this stuff sat in the can for whenever we were going to go tour again, like, let's put it in the can when we're ready to tour again, we'll put out a record. And so now we're finally doing that, that. And so, um, so I was the one who was uh, fortunate enough to have the job since we recorded at my house of taking the, all those raw tapes and making them into the album, and I mixed it and edited it myself with, with some some instruction and help from the, from the guys. But uh, and um, everybody liked liked what I did apparently, or at least they're telling me that, and I'm really proud of it. And I but it was all it wasn't hard to do. It was a joy because there was just so much good music on those takes. It was just really really fun, and and we worked really hard to get a good sound, and that. That's another thing about collaborating. When people have a good sound and they know who they are, it's not that hard. Like people say, well, how do you do it? How do you try to, how do you be this, play with that, these guys? And then how do you play with those guys? And how do you be different? And I, well, I don't really be different. I just try to be myself and try to make it sound right when I'm doing, feel right and sound right and be honest to myself. And when you have four people that are all doing that and they're all being themselves together, but really listening to each other, it, it's just, again, it's just not that hard. It's hard when somebody doesn't have a beautiful sound 
you know, to, to blend with or, or doesn't have a good sense of time or, or pitch. Not a problem here. So um, in a way, it was uh, about as natural as it could be. And, and, and to quote uh, one of your members on the album, uh, you know, so the music emerges as we speak, hence the name of the album, which I thought was, you know, very apropos. I mean, it, it's it's the language, the respective language of the individual players, but you're all talking and listening and you're you're it make it makes makes for a great album well also when you think about instrumentalists sometimes you um let me put it this way instrumentals instrumentalists all want to sing with their instrument and speak with their instrument that's the like i play my banjo i don't sing i don't talk i i, I just i play my instrument and that's my way of speaking and so as we speak is kind of a nod to the fact that all all four of us have made instrumental music our way of communicating and so um you can you can take you know you can have that phrase mean whatever you want it to, but to me it, it was a little bit ironic because no one is speaking, <laughs> and yet we all are. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it it spoke to me. I'm sure it'll speak to not only fans of yours, but fans of just really good music that explores maybe a genre that they've never heard before. And that's one of the things I've always appreciated about you, Bela, and that is I never really listened to the banjo before you. And I said the same thing to Jean-Luc a few months back. I never really, of course, I appreciated the great players, but I never really listened to the violin until I listened to Jean-Luc. And it just, it gave me that new appreciation that you do with the banjo and in the various types of musics that you do on your recordings and live shows. Yeah, well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, I love the banjo. Uh, sometimes I think if I played guitar, I would have had as, as fortunate a career because I stick out. Um, the level of guitar playing is just so high, but I feel like I'm all alone sometimes. I mean, that's not fair to my banjo brethren because there's some phenomenal phenomenons out there, but I'm kind of out there t on a limb trying to figure out how to interact with people, and I'm the only banjo player in the room usually. And so, um, so I, yeah, in a way, um, it's a brand, and if you hear it, People might say, oh, that must be Bela. Well, there are a lot of other people started, you know, doing, not just starting, but creating serious banjo music that's, that I consider very beautiful. So uh, I'm glad, glad to be part of the movement. Glad to be one of the, one of the forerunners. If that's what I end up to be. Tony is too. He was there before me. Bill Keith was there before me. Everybody, it's a, it's a continuum. You got the ball for a while. Keep it in the air as long as you can until somebody, until your arms get tired and someone else will take it and they're, they're lined up behind me. Well, we hope that you continue to run with the ball before you pass it on to someone else because we want to continue to hear great music, not only you know from your duo and collaborative projects, but the Flectones. And I appreciate talking to you again and seeing you again, and we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, man, I do have to say one thing since this this is jazz is. Sure. Uh, I'll just let you know about something that will be coming out um, next year sometime. Well, two projects. Why don't I just tell you about them real quick? Okay. Near, near the end of our time. One is um, before Chick Corea passed away, we did a, a last tour in which we did all new music. Uh, and, the, and that tour was recorded. And then during the pandemic, we started um, collaborating on new music and sending music back and forth. And um, and so there's a whole duet album of new music from Chick and I that's going to be coming out wow. next year that is, um, I think, the high point of what we were able to come up with together as a duo. I'm really proud that... Um, of my association with him, as as we said a little while ago, he was my hero. He was the guy that made me see the, the possibilities of all of this musically, and and becoming um, good friends with him and get uh, was one thing, and getting to play music with him at all was incredible. But I'm really sure. thrilled that he was too. That at the end of our association, we pushed the ball a little bit higher together, and I think we found a whole new some some really nice new directions. Um, I can't wait to hear that. I know we were jazzed to use the word. Um, yeah. Elves and it was it was uh, very very sad to lose him and then oh, the other yeah. thing that i'm working on um is a uh also a pandemic uh thing where you have time on your hands i've always loved rhapsody in blue uh I, new york city two blocks from one of gershwin's uh residences and i saw the movie when i was a kid and i just always loved that piece and so i decided to sort of explore whether i could play any of the piano part on the banjo and it turned out i i can play almost all of it uh, you know, both hands, but quite a lot of it. And, and I'll be starting to perform it with orchestras all around um, the 100th anniversary of, of the pieces uh, 
premiering, which also happens to be just a matter of weeks from Earl Scruggs' hundredth birthday. So um, that's going to be so that that's some of what's coming. And there's there's other things too, but I just wanted to mention them since I've got uh, no. That's great. Uh, we look forward to all that. And uh, me too. I look forward to exploring some more uh, other musical things that you're doing. Maybe we'll do it on another podcast and uh, we'll stay in touch for sure. All right, man. It was a pleasure talking right. to you. Thank you. You too, Bailey. Good to see you again.